Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, we have a few people who've joined us now, I can see. And uh, my name is Heather Gridley. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, I could, I could just still see Rachel, so I thought perhaps I wasn't coming through. But then, of course, you don't see yourself in this situation, do you? Which is probably just as well. Anyway, I'm Heather Gridley, and um, I'm chairing this session. Um, on, and um, I'd like to, first of all, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on, which is the Wewurrung and, uh, and Boonwurrung and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations here in Melbourne. Um, it's NAIDOC week, as I mentioned, I think at yesterday's opening, which means that it's a, a week more of celebration than of focusing on the negative. However, we do know that um, violence against women is, is an issue within Aboriginal communities and is played out there within a wider context of colonisation that is um, very painful for both women, children and men um, in many communities. So um, it's good to keep that in mind while we're also hopefully working from a strength-based approach and a partnership approach, which is very much what this presentation is about. Um, I just need to remind you that um, if you want to, um, if you need translation, actually I don't think we do have translation in this session, but um, if you want to uh, chat, please put your comments or questions into the chat room and uh, we won't be addressing those straight away. We'll be addressing those towards the end of the session. So uh, hold your questions, hold your responses, but we're definitely, if we stick to time, have a good 10 minutes and we'd love to hear your responses to, um, the, um, to each of the presentations and uh, I'm excited to hear them too. Um, I think that's probably all that I need to tell you, except to give a plug for the next session as well, because I'll be involved in that, and that's on gender equity. So um, I think they will flow on very well. And uh, then I'm, so I'm just going to hand over to our first um, presenters, uh, which is Catherine and Sue, and uh, they're going to do this together. And they're going to provide an overview of the whole session of the principles that each of the three presentations has in common, and then we'll go into their particular presentation followed by um, Kim Pearson, followed by Annie Belcher. So thank you, Sue and Catherine. Thank you. Thanks, Heather, for a lovely introduction. Um, and I will um, ask Sue, maybe if you could go on to the next slide. Thank you. So I'm Catherine Darcy. I'm a community psychologist working in the Eastern Metropolitan Melbourne. And I'm presenting today in my role at EACH as part of a partnership and evaluation working group for what has been a long-standing, highly impactful partnership called Together for Equality and Respect, a regional partnership for preventing men's violence against women in the East. So just as an introduction to this symposium, I just wanted to start with, um, oh, sorry, did I, I guess go back, <laughs> with the question of why partner? Now it's an obvious question, easily answered by most psychologists. We partner, I think, in the, the first um, dot point here, which is around achieving more than what we can achieve as individuals or as individual organisations. But I think it's the second part that carries the urgency for us as health promotion people, as people who want to bring about change. Because it's the recognition that effective, well-planned partnership which bring diverse partners to work in a coordinated way on the same issue over time is actually essential if we're going to address the complex social issues that sit behind nearly every health concern that people in the room are working on. So the three presentations in today's session share a common focus on partnership, as well as a common focus on the complex social and health issue of violence against women. We all recognise the importance of partnership as part of the work to address violence against women. And we're here to share our learnings. And those learnings come from diverse types of partnerships in different areas of that area of prevention. And at different points in the continuum, when you think about primary prevention, um, secondary and through to the tertiary. These papers give a small snapshot of a burgeoning area of research and focus. And so some of the topics we're looking at are going to be models of informing effective partnership, um, how to approach challenges and how to evaluate our partnership. So all of the presentations today 
are informed by the theory that we've um, we've been privileged in Australia to have an evidence-based framework called Change the Story, which I encourage you to look for if you haven't seen already. Um, and the slide shows us here is the, the actions that come from Change the Story. So what we know through Change the Story is that addressing violence against women, we have to address the gender drivers the gender drivers of that violence, which include condoning of violence against women, men's control of decision-making and limits to women's independence, stereotype constructions of masculinity and femininity and disrespect towards women and male peer relations that emphasize aggression. So the evidence summarized in this framework, in the Change the Story framework, shows that these drivers are reinforced across all settings and in all arenas of society and at all levels of the socio-ecology. So of course, partnership needs to be a key focus in our work if we're really going to address violence against women. Thanks, Sue. So after introducing the symposium, I now introduce the first paper of the symposium, which is on Together for Equality and Respect by myself and Dr. Sue Rosenhain. We share the learnings from a region-wide collective impact-based partnership, which involve over 30 partners in addressing the gender drivers of violence against women across all settings in the eastern region of metropolitan Melbourne. I'm here with Sue Rosenhain, and we're both going to present on this. Okay, so before I move into that, I just want to, um, to give acknowledgement to the fact that we're all in this meeting on, um, on the land of the Wurundjeri, or well, for me, I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation. And Together for Equality and Respect has been done, the work that we've been doing as a partnership has been working on the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people of um, the Kulin Nation's traditional land. So we acknowledge too that our work in health promotion builds on a long history of so many women and women's organisation across the world who have enabled the recognition of violence against women as an issue and the need to address underlying inequalities faced by diverse women at a population level to address this health, social justice and human rights issue. Finally, we also want to acknowledge that the knowledge that we're sharing today in our presentation comes from the data reflection experience of many partners who make up Together for Equality and Respect Partnership. Okay. Now Thanks. I'll just hand over to Sue, sorry. <laughs> and Sue will jump in before she's been handed over to. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so as Catherine said, this example of practice that we're sharing today is the Together for Equality and Respect Partnership, otherwise known as TIFA. And it was a collaborative cross-sector partnership which originally founded in 2012 with a shared vision to prevent men's violence against women across the eastern metro region of Melbourne. The partnership overall is led by Women's Health East and the evaluation is led by Women's Health East and the two primary care partnerships in Melbourne and each a community health service. The work of the partnership is guided by a regional TIFA strategy now in its seventh year and as Catherine's already said, it's made up of over 30 regional organisations as partners across a broad spectrum of community, health and social services, including seven local governments, community legal service, Aboriginal healing service, women's health, state government departments of health and human services and education and training, the regional primary health network, migrant and multicultural services, Victoria police and the primary care partnerships. Um, there are three uh, key theoretical frameworks that we use to develop the TIFA theory of change and to guide the work of the partnership. Now, each of these could not only be a presentation in and of themselves, but also, you know, a year-long study. So th the focus tonight is going to be the features of these particular um, theoretical frameworks and how they related the elements of the frameworks that particularly helped us build partnerships. And the three frameworks are systems thinking, collective impact, and developmental evaluation. Evaluation of the partnership so far has shown that a diverse partnership focused on a clear goal can be supported by practical application of these three theories using an informed approach. 
That is, by not attempting to perfectly implement each theory correctly, but to take a theory-informed approach, allowing us to meld key components of the theory into an achievable framework, and which allows acknowledgement of the practical realities of the partnership work across a broad region, and that each partners have their own context in which they are accountable and responsible, and their own language and um, other things. The, specific focuses of their context. And whilst I talk about these three frameworks for the um, looking at building the partnerships, we also must note that feminist theory and research is fundamental to TIFA planning, practice and evaluation, and that feminist principles underpin all elements of TIFA. This is the lens through all, which all work under TIFA strategy is viewed. So how did it work? So I've already mentioned that there was one goal and that was one of the key clues to success. So the goal for the vision, the goal or vision for the work under the TIFA partnership is that we have a society where women live free from men's violence, where every girl and boy grows up to be equally valued, heard and respected and with equal access to opportunities. But where to from here? We collectively agree to a goal for the work, but how do we ensure that the partnership work is aligned and that actions are successfully working towards that goal? We think that TIFA provides a unique Australian example of the ways in which systems thinking, collective impact and developmental evaluation, these three theories, can be incorporated into a single framework in order to build partnerships for the work in ways that complement and strengthen each of the theories and the work of each of the partners. So considering each of these three frameworks that inform the chief of theory of change, I'm just going to look now at the particular elements of the theories and how they supported the partnerships. So the features of um, systems thinking is that it considers the role of structure in the conditions that we face, acknowledging that there are laws of systems functioning that we are unaware of, as well as consequences of our actions that we may be unconscious of. Systems thinking also can expand the range of choices available for solving complex problems, such as men's violence against women. And the principles of systems thinking make us aware that there's no perfect solution and that any choices we make will impact on all parts of the system. So how did this help us build partnerships? Well, it helped us to identify many opportunities to contribute to change. And in so doing, it supported partners to contribute where they're best placed and with the resources and their, within their sphere of influence, which in turn enabled smaller efforts to be linked to, bigger, to have bigger influence. Um, collective impact. So the collective impact framework is an approach to addressing complex social issues through collaboration between numerous stakeholders across sectors. It's more than, co it's more than collaboration, collective impact initiatives represent a long-term commitment by significant and invested partners. And if we think about working to um, stop men's violence against women, we need to take a long-term view if we're going to bring about change. Um, and there, it enables investment from partners across a variety of different sectors and with different areas and spheres of influence in relation to the problem. The features of collective impact are that there's a common agenda, shared measurement systems, mutually reinforcing activities, continuous communication and backbone support. It provides, how do these features help? Well, it provides a practical way of demonstrating partner contribution to systems change. So it helps bring systems thinking approach to life. We've already talked about our common goal and the common agenda. Um, and clearly having a common agenda and mutually reinforcing activities that are enabled through thinking about um, the systems and linking smaller approaches to the larger picture helps to link people with similar approaches and interest and that shared measurement helps people to see how their contribution contributes to broader change. It also enables approaches to be described in a language that's consistent with partner understanding and make all contributions apparent. Dedicating resources to backbone support and continuous communication enables the links between people and organisation to facilitate learning and sharing of ideas. So all these elements of um, collective impact reinforce one another about, in order to build the partnership. 
Um, developmental evaluation is an appro evaluation approach defined by its purpose of supporting program development with a focus on innovation and adaptability within complex environments. Um, characteristically in developmental evaluation, the evaluator works collaboratively, collaboratively with participants and other stakeholders to conceptualise, design and test new approaches in a long-term ongoing process that allows adaptation, intentional change and development. So the evaluator is embedded in the work and that was evidenced in TIFA that all of us as the evaluation working group who are working on designing and doing, looking at the shared measurement and providing feedback, we're also contributing to the actions ourselves. And this ensures that the intervention is tailored to fit the complex and continually changing context. So the evaluation is necessarily part of the intervention itself, evolving and adapting alongside the simultaneous processes of planning, implementation, and also the evaluation. So how does this help build partnerships? Well, this enabled practical support for the partners. We could look at the language and the measurement and the timing of when people needed their information for their own reporting and accountability mechanisms. We, so we could provide real-time data which was suited to individual partner requirements. Given that breadth of partnerships that I've spoken about before, we can see that they would all have different language and different accountability mechanisms and so it enabled that to happen and yet all be linked. And it also provided the opportunity to learn from one another. Using the experience of TIFA with the developmental evaluation informed approach showed real benefits by strengthening the partnerships both within and beyond not only the evaluation working group but with all partners through validating practitioner experiences and centering the practice practitioner voice and things such as our community of practice where some partners could present on their early evaluation findings to others who were looking towards similar sorts of interventions gave the opportunity for people to learn and adapt and created the environment a safe environment for people to share what they would do differently another time as well so what did we learn about implementing the theories the key issue to um, our learning or our key learning was that it's important to privilege the issue and not the theory. That we must keep our eye on the change that we're hoping to make and our overall purpose and goal. And that in order to remain focused on this, in this case, the prevention of men's violence against women, the experience of TIFA would suggest that privileging the issue is an important component. The point of an initiative is to bring about change. We're not wanting to ask, have we operationalised the theory correctly? And this is why the collective goal or vision is so important. And this is what we call our theory informed approach. But what else did we learn from the, um, the first four years of the, the T for evaluation? We learned that um, flexibility is really important. While each theory can be flexibly um, implemented in a flexible and informal way, it allows focus on outcomes, especially in circumstances where partners are taking different journeys. Partners are free to contribute to the collective outcome in ways in which they are able, rather than being restricted by, limited by a restricted model of consistent contribution. And we, it allows us to understand that each partner operates within a different context. Um, if the approach is, framed as a collective impact initiative, it is readily understood by partners. But having said that, more work is required for partners to be comfortable with systems thinking and develop, development evaluation. So there's opportunity through this to building partner knowledge and capacity. As I mentioned before in talking about developmental evaluation, real-time responsiveness was very important. It encouraged continuous quality improvement of practice as partners learn from ongoing findings and can be an informal process facilitated by the evaluators, but also more f formally facilitated via community practice sessions, as I mentioned, and other partner forums. And certainly the data that was generated by the evaluation working group was used by organisations in their individual organisation report and accountability mechanisms. I've also mentioned before the importance of a backbone organisation. And so the experience of TIFA partners working in a coordinated way with leadership from Women's Health East has been strongly positive. The resource that goes into 
building the partnership and doing the work and bringing people together and can doing the, contributing to continuous communication is a specific resource need and needs to be acknowledged. And the evaluation found that the TIFA partnership itself has been an enabler for this work under the TIFA strategy, bringing organisations together and supporting the focus on primary prevention. Finally, prioritising the evaluation um, enabled contributions on in-kind support and goodwill, which meant that partner organisations could be inconsistent with support as the um, evaluation clashed with competing priorities. So having the key members of the evaluation working group that I mentioned before, having a dedicated resource to um, contribute to evaluation was a significant enabler. Um, key partners, including the Victorian Regional Primary Care Partnerships, were absolutely invaluable in providing and long-term commitment and experience to the evaluation and the contribution of each as well, um, adding to the, the primary care partnerships and the, the work of each. So that was really important. So in conclusion, I just probably want to say that um, TIFA has harnessed theoretical frameworks to help us build a partnership approach to prevention of violence against women using our theory informed approach. And by giving priority to the issue and using theory as a servant of the vision and goals, we we're able to demonstrate that a culture of collaborative planning and learning, responsive evaluation and trust can build sustainable and productive partnerships to build public health outcomes. So our theory informed, um, not, not theory enslaved approach to doing our work. So I'm gonna put up a, here on the screen now as some of our key resources. Um, you might want to take a screenshot of that and we're also going to put those links in the chat room. I've got there the emails for Catherine and myself and we're happy to answer questions um, subsequent to this um, if because we realise that, that things may occur to you later. Um, so now I'm going to hand over to Dr Kim Shearson to present on the Big Health Gender Equality Through the Arts Project. So I'm going to stop sharing mine now and hand over to Kim. Thanks, Sue. Great presentation. Okay. Good evening or good morning. Um, I'll be discussing a project involving multiple partnerships between local councils and artists to promote gender equality. I'm an academic at Victoria University working with my colleagues and students on this innovative project. So just a little bit of context. Vic Health is a state government body with a mandate to promote good health and the prevention of disease. Given the burden of disease associated with violence against women, Vic Health has an ongoing commitment to the prevention of this violence. Its primary prevention strategies focus on gender equality and community attitudes towards women and violence across various settings. The gender equity through the arts um, grants program or G Arts progresses their work to the art setting. So Vic Health has invited Victorian councils to partner with artists or art organisations to apply for 12 months funding to support the creation of art initiatives that promote gender equality. Art as a mechanism of raising awareness and working towards social change has a long history. Vic Health aimed to use the power of art to raise awareness and promote gender equality and to celebrate women. It also wanted to build capacity by bringing artists and local councils together. Our evaluation seeks to explore how well this worked. 
Due to COVID, the completion of the projects has been delayed. Therefore, in this session, I'll be focusing on the projects themselves and our methodology with some very preliminary findings. Each of the seven projects needed to address at least one of the gendered drivers of violence against women identified in the National Framework for the Prevention of Violence Against Women and Children in Australia. The seven projects were very diverse and the level of community participation varied across the pro projects. Female Futures ran several summer workshops of either five or 10 days with small groups of young women, where the young women worked with artists and produced short films or podcasts exploring gender equality. In contrast, Bayside's Art for a Better Democracy involved 170 women who had their portraits taken. Bayside's provocative portraits raised awareness of the underrepresentation of women in the city of Bayside, and the portraits replaced the predominantly male portraits of past mayors in council chambers. The Port Phillip project partnered with the Girl Geek Academy and conducted the Gender Equality uh, Game Jam, which was a weekend event where participants produced 11 games. And there's an example of one of those games, which was called the Train Shuffle, which raises awareness of predatory behavior against women on public transport. Reclaim the Lanes in the South Gippsland Shire involved four projects in four regional towns. Young women worked in groups with artists to transform public places and increase their sense of safety. The Knox project partnered with a number of artists. It involved art installations in the Baronia shopping mall. In the shopfront exhibition, the art reflected gender inequality. The messaging highlighted discrepancies in women's financial status and representation in government. For example, messages about women retiring on 42% less than men and only 32% of members of parliament are women. In Belit Begurk's Strong Aboriginal Women of the Yarra Rangers project, women told stories of and made dedications to strong Aboriginal women. And these stories and dedications are being published in book form. The city of Yarra partnered with Musical Sprouts for very early intervention to promote empathy, respectful relationships and gender equality to young children in preschool and early primary school. So the real challenge in the evaluation was that each project was so different. Each of the projects were required to conduct their own individual evaluation. And so part of our role was to provide support to the partnerships uh, in undertaking their own evaluations. So we um, co conducted community of practice workshops. We provided individual consultation, feedback um, and advice and guidance on analysis. And we provided resources that helped with their uh, data collection and analysis. So those individual uh, evaluations undertaken by each of the seven projects then formed the case studies in our meta-evaluation. So we can make some comparison across cases, but as I mentioned, with that diversity, it is a little bit hard. Um, however, our main aim is to explore the partnerships themselves. And to that end, we are in the process of interviewing nine project officers and 11 artists who've worked in the various projects to explore their experiences and processes and gain insight into what works well. So some of our early findings, um, we're still waiting for a few projects to finish, 
but we have take, um, collected some of the data and undertaken preliminary um, analysis. So firstly, there's a lot of evidence that the projects certainly have raised awareness and created um, a dialogue, which was one of the main uh, aims of the grants program. Um, and so as uh, one project officer noted that um, people have uh, said to her, um, you know, this project is the, the talk of the town. The notion of art for change is also taking hold. Um, as an artist said, the kids really understood that as an artist, I was saying that I can make a difference, that you can use art as a way to communicate and as a way to make change and to tackle hard stuff. Art for a Better Democracy, the Bayside Portrait Project, received a great deal of media attention. And just the fact that 170 women came forward to participate in the portrait and to wear their silly moustaches shows the impact of this project. The project officer recently reported that 50 women have expressed interest in Bayside in uh, training on how to run for council. Um, and this training is an extension of the project. One thing that we were really interested in was how the projects would be received by community. On the whole, the response has been positive uh, and indeed joyous when we look at the Musical Sprouts uh, show for the young children. Um, but there certainly has been evidence of resistance and pushback. And this came in two forms. Some people thought that the messages were too controversial too confronting and they wanted those messages to be um, changed or modified or they just outright disagreed with what was being said, uh, particularly around um, those statistics in the shop front windows. So there was an element of censorship. The other form was direct pushback to protect male privilege and in one case an attempt was made to cancel the project altogether because it was thought to be insulting to men and discriminating against them. So in responding to this, what was most effective was when the artist and the project officer were able to unite to address the issue. So that uh, idea that um, Sue was talking about the importance of collaboration really came to the front in dealing with resistance and pushback. So there was a real need for them to advocate for the project together. And when this uh, didn't occur, uh, there was a greater tendency for um, the partnership to break down um, and less chance of it uh, proceeding successfully. There's uh, also where gathering some evidence that the young women who participated in the various projects, the, one that, the ones that involved um, more participation than, than um, just an audience, benefited from the positive role modeling of the artists. And as one uh, artist uh, reflected, seeing that it's possible to be Muslim and to think about things differently but still be from that same community. They asked a lot of questions. They're very inquisitive. So thank you for your time. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Vic Health um, for this great opportunity to uh, work in this really exciting and interesting project. I'll now hand over to Annie Belcher for the In Touch Health Justice Partnerships project. Thank you. And I might just interrupt while Annie's getting ready here. Um, I just wanted to say how well you're doing to keep to time. In fact, we've got a, we're a minute ahead of ourselves, so um, that's brilliant, but um, that means we might have a little even more time for discussion. I also just wanted to mention, which I should have mentioned before, that there's a reason for the order of these papers, which you might kind of get as you're hearing them, which is that we had Catherine 
And Sue kind of setting up the theory that, you know, why partner and some of the themes that we discussed when workshopping this symposium um, as to what they had in common. And I think the other was the strong emphasis on evaluation. So we've had the theory, we've now had Kim outline some projects and how they were evaluated. And now I think Annie's um, emphasis is also on the evaluation and some of the lessons we can learn from that. So I just thought I'd put that in the context and um, time for Annie. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just waiting for um, to be able to screen share. I think Rachel should be... I think I'm an attendee rather than the host at the moment. Oh, sorry, Annie. Let me just. <laughs> I'm just going to slip into that just because I'm feeling a bit chuffed because apart from Sue, I taught all of the other three presenters at some stage over the past 30 years. <laughs> so I'm feeling kind of like a great grandmother, but it's pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Annie. Thank you. Sorry. Fine. So I too would just like to um, acknowledge country. I'm coming to you today from Kirai Wurrung country um, and the project itself took place on the lands of the Bunurong and Wurundjeri peoples. And so I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present, particularly during NAIDOC week. So today I'm speaking about the Monash Health In Touch Multicultural Centre Against Family Violence Health Justice Partnership. And I know it is a mouthful, so I'm going to refer to it from uh, here on in as the Monash In Touch Health Justice Partnership. The Health Justice Partnership, this one specifically, was aimed at providing earlier legal access to recently arrived migrant and refugee women experiencing family violence. Just an overview of today's presentation. I'm going to start with health justice partnerships more broadly, and then I'll look specifically at this health justice partnership, the Monash In Touch Health Justice Partnership, an evaluation of that partnership, and then just making a few concluding remarks and thoughts. The theory behind health justice partnerships is really quite strong and comes from a few different, I guess, theoretical frameworks. The first one, Social Determinants of Health by Marmot, and I'm sure as a community psychology conference, we're all probably quite aware of the social determinants of health. And in health justice partnerships, that's referring, I guess, to determinants like uh, income level, poverty, racial discrimination, gender inequity, access to housing. And in that same way that there's specific de determinants that impact one's health, Health justice partnerships also recognise that there's social determinants of legal problems. So there's certain determinants that will increase your likelihood of coming into access and into contact with the legal system. And they're really similar determinants, not surprisingly. So again, things like poverty, racial discrimination, family violence, the type of work you engage in, mental illness or living with a disability. And it's also just worth noting that health justice partnerships were established in response to medical legal partnerships in the US, so in response to a few things, but I think it's just remiss not to mention that legal medical legal partnerships exist in the US, very similar under a different name. As well as a really strong theoretical underpinning, health justice partnerships as a model also have a really strong evidence base. So there was a landmark study in 2012 in Australia that found that one fifth of people in Australia experienced three or more legal problems in a given year, which is quite huge <laughs> to me. It feels like a, a huge amount of the population. And unsurprisingly, thinking about social determinants of health and social determinants of legal need, there is a relationship between these two things. So we are often seeing similar clusters of people and clusters of problems. Um, the other finding in this study was that people tend not to seek legal support. So a lot of people didn't seek legal support and for people who did seek support, they often sought it from health professionals rather than lawyers or legal support services. So taking these two things together, health justice partnerships, but will embed lawyers into healthcare settings where we know people are accessing and we know they're seeking legal support from. It's just health, just, um, health providers obviously don't have the expertise to provide legal support. Just an overview of health justice partnerships in Australia. So Health Justice Australia is the peak body that oversees them. At the time of writing this, there might be more now, they're popping up quickly. There were 73 health justice partnerships. Most of them are in Victoria and New South Wales. They're both in metropolitan and rural settings, and they're in a huge range of health settings. And the, law, the legal side of it, I guess, is also quite broad in that we've, there's both community legal centres, um, 
the one I'll speak about is actually a family violence organization that has lawyers incorporated into it. And there's also corporate law firms that do pro bono work to support health justice partnerships. Um, because of these common clusters, I guess, of the kinds of people or the population groups that are more likely to experience legal and health needs, they're also set in specific settings such as um, drug and alcohol settings, family violence services, child and maternal health care services. Um, and it's also interesting, and I think again and again, it just points to environmental factors, social determinants that um, influence who will experience these problems. And that there's really common health and legal issues that are seen. So some common health issues are things like mental illness, drug and alcohol issues, injury, chronic disease, pregnancy and baby health. And then some common legal issues are things like family violence, family law, fines, housing, care and protection, credit and debt. And I think it's worth reiterating here that even though certain people and groups of people will experience legal need, it is not because they are more likely to engage in criminal behaviour, it is because of the, of the environment or because of um, discrimination, low income, not being able to pay a fine, being over-policed. It's very much a societal systemic influence rather than an individual um, behaviour. And I think, I mean, again, coming from a community psychology conference with a lot of community psychologists here, I'm sure we all think, I guess, in that systemic way. So we've got, a, I guess, the theory behind health justice partnerships, the evidence to support the model, and then there's also a lot of evaluations of existing health justice partnerships. Overwhelmingly, they're considered really successful. There have been a lot of evaluations, particularly out of ANU, and there's a few um, researchers you can see there. There's Karen, who's one of the um, academics that's done a lot of work on these. And I guess most importantly, what are the, the key elements or the key findings from these evaluations? And I've just pulled out a couple here. You, that, I mean, again, you could do a whole presentation on just the evaluations alone. But I guess the main things I've really noticed, and I think this will tie into what I'll speak to, to the findings from the specific health justice partnership I'm speaking about, um, are that health justice partnerships take time. And I think that's true to all partnerships. And I think we've heard that in the previous presentations, that relationships really matter. And that's spoken about and with different language through different evaluations. Um, I think sometimes it's pointed to staff are important or personalities are important. And I think we could tease that out a little bit more. Um, and another point was having a shared purpose, so shared goals, shared activities, also really important in making sure that the health justice partnerships are at work. And I guess when we're saying effective here, it's, it's effective in meeting their aims, which is to provide legal access to people who wouldn't otherwise seek it and to provide earlier legal access. So like I mentioned at the start, this this um, presentation specifically about this health justice partnership between Monash Health and In Touch. It was set in Dandenong predominantly, although Monash Health could refer from their other um, hospitals, but we just mainly worked with Dandenong Hospital. Recently arrived migrant refugee women. So In Touch defined that as recently arrived in the last five years. And I guess for full disclosure, so I worked at In Touch in a short term position to establish this health justice partnership. So I, um, in setting it up, primarily worked with the Monash Health Social Workers because they're the ones that have to do the referrals out of the hospital. And that's what we were looking for, referrals out of the hospital to in touch. We also worked with the maternity clinic staff because evidence shows that really, really sadly, if you are a pregnant person, you're more likely to experience family violence. The evaluation, so I guess I've got to be careful with positioning myself. So I worked at InTouch to set up the Health Justice Partnership. The evaluation I did as part of, a, part of a master's thesis, and it's really nice to have Monica Nasland here today, um, who supervised this um, master's project, master's thesis. And because of the parameters on, I guess, a master's thesis, the ethics, the short-term nature of it, and the timing of it, uh, I designed the evaluation while in the job, but broke it into two parts. So the first part um, I undertook, and that's what we're focusing on, which was about between six to 12 months post the implementation of the establishment of the Health Justice Partnership to focus on whether the partnership itself was sustainable. And then in the design of that evaluation was to have another evaluation six to 12 months down the track to look at whether it's effective in meeting its aims. So slightly different um, focuses. <clears throat> you do not need to read all of this. There's a huge amount of writing here. I just wanted to provide, I guess, the theory or the frameworks 
that went into thinking about how to do the evaluation. This comes from the Federation of Community Legal Centres. The community legal centres are really present in health justice partnerships. And this is a really helpful framework. Obviously, because I was just looking at the sustainability, I looked only at the right column there. So you can see effective community legal centres. I'll show you a little bit more detail there. Again, don't read it. There's a lot happening, but it just shows that, um, yeah, I guess the theory of change or the framework that so someone else did the thinking, the evidence behind what flows into the outcomes we want. And I used that um, along with other health justice partnerships evaluations to design this evaluation. And I guess a lot of the, from both that framework and previous evaluations, the outcomes we wanted could be really clustered into these four areas. So staff's perspectives of perceived support, value and credibility, engagement and trust and increase in relevant skills. And so I also use staff perspectives because of the timing of the project and also ethics. Um, it, was, it was hoped that later down the track when there was more time that we would look at uh, client outcomes and client perspectives as well. So I'm not going to go into the detail with the findings, I guess, I think um, it will, it just would take too much time, but it's also, I think, a bit more interesting to think high level as to what we found. So just a few key enablers for why this partnership was sustainable, or staff believed it was a sustainable partnership. And as you can see, there are things like responsive and accountable staff, support from management, good governance, open, good communication, um, an appropriate model a common desire for good outcomes for clients. And I think, yeah, so just put in brackets, say valuable service, because that came through a lot from the staff and particularly Monash Health staff who were not paid for this work. They sat on top of their workload, really articulating and seeing that this had a good outcome for their clients, really created, they just cared so much. And it was really quite amazing to see what they did above and beyond. I mean, amazing in some ways, amazing and not, but I guess um, you don't want to burden people with workload, but it was quite surprising and um, yeah, admiring, I guess. And there are also a few limitations um, that were noted. And again, these are really strongly echoed through other evaluations of health justice partnerships. One big one was the lack of availability presence of the health justice partnership lawyer. So we only have funding for the lawyer to be doing health justice partnership work one and a half days a week. And as, across so many staff, of course, that's um, I guess reduces how available that person is. Competing projects and priorities, and I think that's really referring to, um, I guess, the limited time the health justice lawyer has, but also the hospital was rolling out programs at the same time. So they had the, the strategic hospital response to family violence happening at the same time. They had a big change to an electronic management system. So I think there were just a lot of new information to take on board. Um, Part-time work and lack of funding are also highlighted. So just a few, I guess, conclusions from the findings, I guess kind of, I guess theorizing some of the findings is that relationships really matter. And I think um, teasing out, and I noticed reading through previous evaluations, there were a lot of you know, friendly staff was helpful, approachable staff was helpful. And I think, yeah, trying to really tease out what, what makes a person or what makes a staff member good at a partnership, what makes someone approachable and how do you skill and resource people to be good at that? Um, and so a few things, thinking about self-awareness and um, yeah, being res resourced to be responsive. I guess it also made me think that a lot of these skills aren't often seen as legitimate skills or a legitimate use of work time when you're having a coffee with someone and getting to know them so they trust you and that there's easy communication. Um, I also think they're really feminized skills and therefore often undervalued. The other over, I guess, overall finding is that they're really, I think health justice partnerships are a really great model. Uh, time and time again, they appear to be effective. Staff really see the benefit for clients. Um, and yeah, when we, I guess we go back to the start, we're thinking about groups of people that are more likely to have poor health and legal needs. I guess finding models where you can reach people that won't access support that is available and creating support um, is, is really good and I think a lot of the people involved in health justice partnerships see that. So yes, that's all I have for you today. I'll hand it back to Heather. Thank you, Annie. And uh, 
Well done. It's um, it, we've got five minutes, so we didn't quite get our ten minutes, but we somehow crept a couple of minutes. But I'd really like to throw it open to people because there's a lot in those three presentations, and I know what I could say, but I've probably already said it. So um, yeah, um, if you want, we haven't got that many people. If you want to unmute yourself and just put your hand up, if you've got something to say, that would be really good. And um, oops, I'll go to gallery view so I can make sure I see any hands that go up. Um, or just responses, questions. I can see we've got people here from South Africa and I think Indonesia and uh, a few other places that I can recognise. So it would be really good to hear how that sounds to you and as well as interstate because this was an all, an all Melbourne um, uh, presentation we have to confess to not terribly international. Um, any, anything that Jenny had your hand up for a while. No? Who was that? <laughs> Sorry, Sue, who had their hand up? Oh, Jenny had put a hand up a while ago. I don't know if that was to... Uh, Jim. Jenny Sharples, did you have something you wanted to say? No. Doesn't look like it, yeah. Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, go to ask if you've got any questions of each other as presenters. I know we had some pretty rich discussions when we were getting ready, so you're welcome to kind of um, replicate that for the uh, the people who are here. Also, there's a question in the chat there from Tina. Oh, Jenny just said, uh, yeah, not right now, it was a great session, but uh, Peter has asked, if you had your time again, would you change anything? That's a good one. Oh, I can jump in on that because so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think resources, funding time. Um, and again, I guess that's all of the findings where relationships take time and to, to fund that properly. And I guess, yeah, thinking about ethics, it would be lovely to spread that, the establishment out, to have a dedicated work on establishing a partnership in an ongoing capacity, not in a short term thinking of you can do it and move on and this will run itself. That's, I think wishful thinking to an extent um, and also getting a range of perspectives and uh, client perspectives would be so valuable. Um, but again, that just takes time to make sure it's ethically sound and, and to do with care. Kim or Catherine, do you want to respond to that too? Um, yeah, I, in terms of what I do again, I think, I think this experience um, has really sort of taught me the importance of, I guess, getting to know those partnership, uh, the people involved in the partnerships before we start planning the evaluation, um, which is a little bit hard to do the, um, because the projects were, were sort of planned before Vic Health uh, brought us on, on board. So they had already sort of planned out their evaluation. But I think we've really, I guess, learnt a lot about working with people to do evaluation um, with people who've perhaps not done very much of that before at all. So some of the project officers were uh, from the arts department and some of the, uh, some of the uh, artists took the lead on the projects. So for example, the Musical Sprouts, the, uh, the, uh, the group that does musical theatre for young uh, children. Uh, working with them has been a delight, but I wish I had have had a better understanding before I started of sort of where they were coming from. And I think if I was doing it again, then in working that out with Vic Health, I would be in a much better position to offer, um, you know, a little bit more input in, into how that should be managed, I think. Yeah, so that's been a big, a big learning. Great. And um, I'll ask Catherine and Sue to respond to that too, because I think it's a really valuable question. And and linked with that, I'm also wondering, but I'm going to have to go, so I won't hear the answer to this, is um, about any kind of paradigm differences between um, different professions like the law versus health, where there's some different ways of responding that it needed to be navigated, different languages used and such. So um, I'll toss in and I actually need to leave for the next session to go into a different Zoom, but I don't think Rachel's going to press close down the session yet, so you can keep going um, even if I disappear. Um, but Sue and Catherine. Thanks, Heather. Um, 
Yeah. I, think, I think that is a really important point that we learned and maybe taking a little bit more time at the start to understand the explicit language and accountability requirements of each of the, the partners in which is very significant when we think about the breadth of organisations and sectors that were in, involved um, from, you know, local government to Vic Pole and um, migrant and multicultural health services and education and training and the difference between that department, state department and health and human services, you know, the language and understanding and, and what they needed to report on to help um, build the partnership through supporting people to do their evaluation. But I think that's such a powerful part of this approach was that we did have a resource to help support the evaluation, which so often is not provided for within the context of the work that happens at the organisational level. So I don't know if you want to comment on that as well, Catherine. It sort of did, it, it was powerful in because we had something to offer that other people didn't have expertise and where they did, they didn't necessarily have the time or the resources to dedicate to getting some of that sort of information. I don't know if yeah. what you the, want to add, Catherine, yeah. <laughs> so the, I just wanted to add um, the, the challenge, I guess, of being evaluators and in collective impact, so many pieces can contribute to really big changes. And I just threw into the chat that, you know, the huge increase in our local council's um, representation of women in this recent, so we've only had local council um, and that was in the outery. So one of the areas that relates both to Kim's project, because Giet's, she talked about the Baronia Mel. Um, and I think the, I think, it, you know, it was quite, um, hard for me to hear but about the motion being put to actually stop the project so that's obviously and as someone who works in Knox I know that there was councillor resistance to gender equality work um, and I'm really happy at this stage in the world to be able to say out of eight out of nine councillors are now women in that and it yeah one of one of our most resistant councillors <laughs> has gone um, so I guess from an evaluation perspective, how do you show that? How do you, I really believe that some of the work of TIFA, some of the work of um, you know Vic, Vic Health, some of the work that that everyone around the table has probably been involved in in some degree has impacted on some of those things. Really big changes, but there's no way of us showing that pathway. So um, we don't have. And we don't want to put that amount of resources into the evaluation. We want to keep it for the innovation. So it's always yeah. that balancing act. Um, but some of the great presentations and community site um, at the conference have talked about the partnerships with universities and ways around that. I just think, yeah, TIFA really showed some of that um, that challenge around how do you how do you hold those areas of space and always wanting to show the big impacts and knowing that that we're contributing as a partnership but yeah showing it's quite difficult so I, I'm going to claim that I'm claiming those counsellors because <laughs> 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 I really believe that TIFA mm -hmm. and yeah the arts projects and those mm -hmm. sorts of things have really sort of slowly impacted on the culture. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that Bayside Council where Art for a Better Democracy was held is a very affluent area so you're really seeing that white male privilege dominate in that council because their numbers are very very low um, but hopefully changing because 50 women want to be trained, want to, want to get more information about how do I put my hand up. So let's see uh, next year. Um, uh, I just, a couple of comments uh, very briefly because of, of time as well. Um, I'd really like to um, honour the fact that evaluation is just taking more and more of a prominent role in, in, in moving forward and in the, in the area of change, social change. Um, and, you know, uh, we've, we've got to learn uh, and share uh, a lot more about how evaluations work and how they're so effective. 
with corporations, with with partnerships, you know, mm. because um, there's so much that can be done with evaluation. Um, and secondly, the people who do them, you know, just talking about that level of underlying level of, of the, the commitment, uh, you know, embedding oneself in an evaluation, you're actually really giving something of yourself. And I think that as part of the social change too, that, you know, acknowledging that is really exciting. Um, and it's, yeah. it's what I've seen, you know, in, in all the presentations here today, you know, there's, yeah. there's been the person uh, involved in the, in the work and, and I thank you for that. And I think we need to name it more um, as a really valuable contributor to yeah. the result. I think um, just a little plug for our community psychology course at the U because we, you know, we're training the next, um, the next lot of people who mm. can go out there with evaluation experience. Mm. And Elise mm. Bryant is in here listening tonight. And she's our, one of our ComSych students and she did all the artist interviews for me. And uh, she did a wonderful job. I think she did a better job than I would have done if I did it myself. So, um, you know, it's a great uh, opportunity to, to, you know, yeah. to, yeah upskill people in those areas as well. Mm -hmm. I think you've got to the, you're up to time, I'm afraid. Yep. And I, I think other sessions might be starting um, and some of them really relevant to the speakers here. So I can imagine you want to get to, get to them. Um, this will be recorded and it'll go onto that page, um, which it doesn't have a click right now, but it will have a click and there'll be a discussion section there as well. So yeah, great guys. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for your interest, Thank everyone. You. Thanks for your help, Rachel. Thanks, Not a Rachel. problem.